Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday School. This is our fourth and final lesson in Jude. I hope you've enjoyed these lessons as much as I have. Before we jump into this lesson, let's go ahead and open in prayer. Father, we thank you. Thank you for these lessons in Jude. Thank you for this book. Father, thank you for the change that is taking place in us. Father, continue to make us more like you and less like our world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I said, this is our fourth lesson in Jude. Our title this morning is a reminder of who we are. Jude has told us a lot in this little book. He has talked to us about the two fronts that people attack our God and Savior, the front of sensuality and the front of denying Jesus as Lord. He's told us about false prophets and false teachers. He's taught us about their fates, and he's provided us a means of identifying them even when they're in our midst. Now he ends his book with what I feel is the, what he wanted to write in the beginning, a call to those of us in Christ who are called beloved, a call to persevere by reminding us of what, how we are to persevere in Christ. So let's go ahead and jump into the passage. We're going to look at verses 17 through 23 for the majority of our lesson today, and then we'll end with verses 24 and 25 in Jude's doxology. Jude writes in verse 17, But you remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you in the last time, There will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is those who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit, but you, beloved, building yourself up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. Do others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. So here we see Jude expressing to us this call to persevere, this call to be in Christ. In this last section, much like his earlier sections, it is packed with information. We're going to focus on four main verbs in this section, four commands, four verbs in the imperative mode, and actually four verbs that are used as infinitives. The verbs are to remember, to keep, to have compassion, and to save. These are going to be prominent in our study this morning, especially in relation to the, the call to persevere in Christ. We are to remember, according to Jude, who we are in response to these ungodly influences that Jude has just exposed us to. We are not to react to them or to root ourselves in our response to them, but instead we are to remember what the apostles told us and root ourselves in what we know. We are to keep ourselves in the love of God. We are to keep ourselves in the things of God. We are to have compassion on those who are lost, on those who doubt, on those who are in darkness. And we are to save others, save as many as we can, snatch them out of the fire. Not that we save anyone, but that we are to be a means that God uses to save others. All of these verbs, as I said, are infinitives and can be used as commands. Jude is using them to command us to be these things, to follow these things, to act in these ways. This is his opinion. This is his strong statement to us. As we live our lives, we are to examine ourselves according to these four main verbs. Jude is calling us to search our lives in regard to how we live daily. He's exhorting us to look at what the foundation is that we are using. He's exhorting us to look at ourselves in Christ and not all that is taking place in the world. He understands the temptation that we will have to root ourselves in responding to the world, but he doesn't want us to fall victim to that temptation. He wants us to root ourselves in who we are in Christ. I think that's pretty sound advice in relation in relating to what is going on in the world today. I know I have a tendency to, to respond too much to the world and not root myself in Christ the way I should. So, we're going to look at four calls, or I'm sorry, three calls from Jude. And we'll start with Jude's call to remember. We are called to remember. Jude writes in verse 17, But you must remember, beloved, the prediction of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jude is calling us to remember who we are. He uses the term beloved. And I think it's interesting that he uses this term of endearment in this fiery letter about false prophets and false teachers. Beloved, he says. In other words, God loves you. He wants to remind us in the midst of all that he's exposing us to in regards to the world, in the midst of all that he wants to remind us that God loves us and that we are precious to him. But he also wants to remind us of some things that we need to remember. He wants us to remember the command to remember. 
as I said, the verb is a command. It's a strong command to remember the things you know, to remember the things you already have been taught. Uh, the, the verb remember is defined as to remind, to remind oneself what is already known. Jude is not exposing us to any new information here. He's just asking us to recall, to fall back on the things we already knew. And then he's asking us to remember what we are to remember. The words, where they came from. These words, these predictions, they came from the apostles. They're specific things. They were written and spoken. They're eyewitness testimonies. They're statements. They're references to past letters and epistles. References to those words from the apostles, which we know are inspired by a holy God. And then he wants us to remember by whom the words were spoken, as I just referenced. They are spoken. They were, they were impacted, influenced by a holy God. First Timothy 1.13 tells us that, and 3.16 tells us that. They were influenced and impacted by Christ, by the Holy Spirit. And Jude does not want us to miss that these words were authoritative. 2 Thessalonians 3.14 tells us that. They are authoritative and they are words to live by. And then he wants us to remember the content of the words, what these words were about, what they taught, the ideas that they presented. They were not words of mortal men. They were not words in a book or just spots of ink on a white piece of paper. These were words inspired by a holy God through men. They have authority and we are to live by them. But then Jude shifts in the middle of all this back to the threats. He writes in verses 18 and 19, They said to you in the last time, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. So Jude is rooting us in who we are in Christ, but then he does not want us to forget what's out in front of us and how the attacks will come. He wants us to remember the threats that will come from the false prophets and false teachers. This word scoffers is in reference to they scoff at God. They disregard who God is. And then he tells us what they will cause. They will cause divisions. And who they are, they're worldly people, devoid of the Spirit. These are not believers. These are ones owned by the evil one. They are rooted in this world. We are sojourners in this world. And Jude wants us to recognize the fact that they are opposite of who we are. He wants us to see, to see this stark contrast between those of us rooted in Christ and those of us rooted in the world. We are beloved. The term has been used in this, in this epistle. Other language has been used in reference to those in the world, and it's not in any relation to being beloved by God. It's more being an opponent of God. We know the predictions of the apostles. We are given the words of the apostles. They are not. We know what is coming because we have been told the end times. They have not. We tend to unite. They tend to divide. We follow God, and Jude tells us they follow their own passions, and then he defines their passions. They're ungodly. And then he talks about the Holy Spirit. We know Paul tells us twice in Corinthians that we are temples of the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit dwells inside us. Jude says they are devoid of the Holy Spirit. So he wants us to see the stark contrast between those of us in Christ and those of us, those in the world. And then he wants us to remember the end times. There will be those who follow their own ungodly passions. And these ungodly passions will be presented as real and true. They will compete with truth. They will compete with the scriptures. They will present themselves like the scriptures, but they are not. And Jude wants us not to forget that they will lead some astray. Remember last week we talked about men running away from truth to myth, running to the things that tickle their ears. Jude says these, these are the things that will happen in the end times. He reminds us of what we are not to remind us of who we are in Christ. And then he segues to another calling a calling to keep ourselves in the love of God. He writes in verse 20, But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. There are three commands contained in these two powerful verses. The command to build yourself up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. The command to keep yourself in the love of God and the command to wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Build, keep, wait. Build is to move forward, is to build off of a foundation. This is our faith, and we'll talk about this a little bit deeper in, in, in the next section. Maintain. We are to maintain what is excellent, what is godly, what is Christ-centered. We are not to maintain what is worldly. And then we are to wait. We are to have patience for the Lord. 
Our future is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are only sojourners here. So we are not to root ourselves here, but we are always to look ahead. So let's dig into these just a bit and look at these three commands. The command to build yourself up in the most holy of faith. This is what we are to do. This is our spiritual life, our spiritual life. Always building, always building off the foundation of Christ, but always building up, always ongoing. This is a present participle. It's continuous. It's an ongoing action. The most holy faith that Jude references, this is our faith in Christ. This is the foundation for our faith. This is the rock-solid foundation that we build our faith off of. And we are building united in prayer. What Jude wants us to recognize is as we build ourselves up in our faith, he understands our tendency. He understands that we are finite beings, that we had past sin natures, and therefore we need to make sure that we are united in, with God in this, and prayer does that. This word praying is the same present participle as building. It's continuous, an ongoing action. And Jude wants us to not miss that we pray as believers. In Romans 8, 9, it references this. We pray to draw near to God. Ephesians 2, 18 talks about this. We are to pray with sincere hearts in humility. Hebrews 10, 22 commands us to do this. We are to pray in faith, as we are taught in James 1, 5 through 8. We are to pray according to God's will, James 4, 1, and 1 through 10. And then we are to pray in submission to God's will, Proverbs 28, 9. When you pray this way and you build yourself up in your faith, then you are united with God and your faith is Christ-centered. Then Jude talks about keeping yourself in the love of God. He talks about by grace and favor, God's love is in you as a believer. This is kind of a paradox because basically to keep yourself in the love of God, God has to have first placed his love in you. You have to be a believer. You have to have the love of God in you to keep yourself in the love of God. But as believers, there are responsibilities. We are called to worship with other believers. We are called to be held accountable by other believers. We are called to root ourselves in scripture, to be in prayer. These are things that we can do. These are things that keep us in the love of God. And then we are called to wait. We are called to wait for the mercy of Jesus Christ. Our faith is a faith that looks forward. It looks towards our citizenship, which is in heaven. It doesn't root ourselves in where we are now. It's always looking forward to Christ. But that means we have to wait. That means we have to be patient. That means we have to trust. This idea of waiting is an idea of trusting in who God is and trusting in his timing. As, as people who live in this world, we live in the midst of people who have no patience. But we are to be different. We are to be the opposite of that. We are to wait on God, wait on Jesus. So this idea of calling to keep ourselves in the love of God actually leads to another calling, the idea, the call to have mercy. In that wait, we are to wait not only trusting in God, but also with mercy because that is what God has extended us. In verses 22 and 23, Jude writes this, and he says, and have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. Do others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. So Jude has called us to have mercy. And he's called us to have mercy in three different areas. As we rescue, despite the danger, and with fear. We are called to rescue with mercy. Mercy means to have pity or mercy on, to show mercy. We are not called, are we not called to offer the same mercy God has offered us, as God has given us? We are called to do this as we rescue. And the idea of rescue here is the idea of God using us to save others, just like he saved us. We are to be a means that he can use, and we are to have mercy when we do that. And we are always to remember the mercy God extended to us. The second is we are called to rescue despite the danger. We are called by to be a means of rescue. And sometimes God calls us to places that push, positions us in peril or danger but we are still to answer that call. We are called to save. In a sense, this call to save, this call to rescue, this word is not, again, um, determining that we are the rescuer, but it's saying that we are a vessel of rescue. And inside that word is the ideas of proclaiming truth to non-believers, warning them of their, the ways of their sin, the means of their sin, and then praying for them, praying diligently for them. 
we are to be units of a rescue that God can use. And we are to be ready at a moment's notice, as referenced in 1 Timothy 4.16 and James 5.19-20. And then says God says, uh, and then Jude says, we are called to show mercy with fear. Interesting statement here, the idea of with fear. When you and I hear the word fear, we immediately think internal, self, we are afraid. That's not what the word means here. The word is in reference to an attitude, an attitude of awe and great respect. This is how we are to show mercy, not as proud and arrogant, but as humble and sincere with great respect and awe of what God has done with us and how he has shown mercy to us. The fear of God is this idea of awe and great responsibility. It's the only fear we should have. It is the awe of eternal consequence, a view of our responsibility and understanding of the danger we're in when we engage in sin, but the awe, aweness of that God would use us to save anyone. John MacArthur says this of this fear. He says, this fear stems from an awareness that getting too close to corrupt apostate error could result in somehow being tainted by those lies. That should always be in our minds because sin is dangerous. Sin could taint us. God has saved us from sin, but he has not removed sin from our lives. We sin daily, but hopefully we grow closer to Christ and further away from our sin. But we can't dabble with it. We, when we engage others who are in sin, we must be aware that it's dangerous. And we must keep that in our mind. So back to our four infinitives. To remember, to keep, to have compassion, and to save. These should drive our actions as believers every day, according to Jude. As we remember who we are in Christ, we do so remembering who we are without Christ. We understand what he has done for us. We actively keep ourselves in the faith, remembering it is a daily ongoing action that first involves his love in us and then our responsibilities. We have compassion on the lost because without Christ, we would still be lost and in darkness. We are open to being used by God to save others in whatever means God chooses to use us because he saved us. To remember, to keep, to have compassion, and to save. Jude says these are the actions that will keep you from stumbling if you know and rest in who God is. And that if is an if that Jude answers with the doxology at the very end. It is my feeling that this is the part of the letter that Jude wanted to make the complete letter. This is what he wanted. This is what he wanted to share with the believer. This is what he wanted to root his letter in. God called him to write a different letter, but he ends with the place he wanted to be in the first place, and that's the doxology. Verses 24 and 25, Jude writes, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. The doxology is that which brings comfort and encouragement to those of us in Christ by reminding us of the faithfulness and power of the God we serve. One author put it this way. He says, It is for the Christian to pillow his head upon these blessed and soul-inspiring truths and thus rise, rise above all discouragement and so go on in holy confidence. Is that not great advice for the, the world that we're dealing with currently and the culture that we see out there? I think it is. I think it's really encouraging for me to, to read that, that quote. What is the doxology? It is the truth about God. Jude ended with the truth of God. It is ascribing to God all glory and praise. It is an expression or a hymn of praise to God rooted in the truth of who he is. The word in the Greek is broken down Doxa is glory and praise, and logos is word and declaration, so its, its definition is it's a declaration of praise to God. What does it communicate? It communicates God's power, what God is able to do, his moral perfection, his perfect fellowship, his perfect blessedness, his wisdom, his perfect ends and means. It is a reminder of who God is and who we are not and why we need a Savior. It expresses his glory, which is praise, honor, and exaltation to him alone. It expresses his majesty. He is great and majestic, and there is no one like him. It expresses his dominion. He is all-powerful. And finally, it expresses his power. He is the ultimate authority. The doxology is a great encouragement to the believer walking in the midst of a culture that is hostile to God. So I'll end this lesson by repeating Jude's words in verses 24 and 25, and then we'll close in prayer. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless 
before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for the book of Jude. We thank you that contained in this little book is a powerful message for all of us. Father, may it, may it have changed our hearts, oriented us more towards you, and made us more like you. Prepare our hearts now for worship, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.